Hi, this is Mr. Wardsky, and today we'll be talking about energy and hopefully cell respiration. If at any time you need to pause the video, please do so and take the notes. You can always review the video as well as get the information from your textbook. It's a good text, or you can ask me tomorrow in class. So today we're going to discuss energy and energy production. So in order to avoid death, we produce energy. That is our sole purpose is to produce enough energy to avoid dying. Now, energy is the capacity to do work, and there are two forms. There's kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, and potential energy, which is the energy of location. Thermodynamics is the study of energy, and we're going to go over two laws of thermodynamics. So the first law states that energy can be changed from one form into another that cannot be created nor destroyed. So we can store energy in chemical bonds, and the energy is used to form those bonds. And when the bonds are broken, energy is released. Bonds contain potential energy, and when the bonds are broken, some of the energy is lost as heat. You might be asking yourself, why? That has to do with the second law of thermodynamics. See, in all of energy conversions, if no energy enters or leaves the reaction, the potential energy of the final state is always less than the potential energy of the initial state. So some of the energy is lost as heat, and those are called exergonic reactions. And there's an equation down here. We have A yields B plus heat. Now, endergonic reactions are when you add energy to start the reaction. So energy plus A yields B. Entropy also affects potential energy. The final state has more entropy than the initial state. Entropy is the disorder of a system, and systems always move towards disorder or stability. And this might be counterintuitive, but stability is disorder. Now, highly ordered systems like us need energy to be maintained. So like a house, which is highly ordered, you need to maintain your house, and that takes energy. Your room, when it's clean, needs energy to maintain its cleanliness. That is energy. Disorder doesn't need to be maintained so it is more stable. So either you have a house that needs to be maintained to keep its orderliness, or you can have a pile of rubble, and you don't need to do anything to the pile of rubble. You don't need to maintain it because it'll always be a pile of rubble. So disorder is much more stable than order. So we have pictures of a stable and unstable house. Stable house is on top. The unstable is low because it needs to be maintained. So when your parents tell you to clean your room, you want to tell them that you want your room to be as stable as possible. So it needs to be disordered. Free energy. So now we're getting into how we can apply all this information to biology. This is really cool stuff. Highly ordered systems move to stability versus, uh, through spontaneous reactions. Okay, so spontaneous reactions are bad. We need to add energy to the system to combat against spontaneous reactions. That's why we need to produce energy to fight against spontaneous reactions. Free energy is the amount of energy needed to fight entropy. So free energy is represented by the letter G, which stands for Gibbs free energy. Now, free energy, or G, is made up of three components. Temperature in degrees Kelvin, H, which is enthalpy, and for us, it's the ability for us to produce energy. 
and S, which is entropy, which is the movement towards stability, which we've been talking about. The three parts can be put into the Gibbs free energy equation, which states that delta G, or change in free energy, is equal to delta H, or change in enthalpy, minus T, temperature, delta S, which is entropy. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And you'll be seeing that from time to time and applying that in different situations. So you need to think of delta G as the ability to combat stability. That rhymes. <laughs> I'm a poet and I had no idea. The more delta G, the more successful you are at fighting stability. The less delta G, the less successful you are at fighting stability. So over time, your delta H will decrease because your mitochondria, through mutations, when you'll find out why, don't produce as much energy. So with a decrease in delta H, if T delta S is, maintains constant, then your delta G will drop. And as your delta G drops, you are less successful at fighting stability. And that is old age. If we could, over time, maintain our ability to produce energy, we would never get old. Think of that. Now, in enzyme reactions, if we increase T, we will also have a decrease in G. With that decrease in G, you, move, you have spontaneous reaction, you move to stability, the protein will change shape, and the reaction will stop. So we can apply the Gibbs free energy equation to different situations. Now, at the end, it says we use exergonic reactions to do endergonic reactions. You might be asking yourself, what the heck is he talking about? Hopefully you haven't been asking that question the whole time I've been talking. So we remove a phosphate from ATP, and that releases energy. That's exergonic. And we will use that energy for reactions, which is endergonic. If you remember the endergonic reactions, we used energy, added it to a compound to produce another compound. The molecule used for energy in our cells is ATP. That is our energy currency. And all of our cells, usable energy is stored in this molecule. So we might want to talk a little bit about ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. Here is a picture of that beautiful molecule, ATP. You will notice that there is an adenine group over here. There is a ribose sugar right here. And we have one, two, three phosphates. Now, you might think that the energy comes from this ribose sugar, and you would be wrong. The energy comes from the three phosphates located right here. You will notice that the phosphates are negatively charged, and you know that like charged ions will repel each other, but they are bonded by covalent bonds. So we have a very volatile situation here in which the phosphates want to move away from each other, but they're stuck together. If we break that covalent bond between the two phosphates, energy is released. And we're talking about seven kcals or kilocalories of energy that's released. And that is the, just the right amount of energy. It's the Goldilocks situation. Any more would be too much, any less would be too little. Seven kcals is just right due to the negatively charged phosphate. I always tell people it's like a really bad relationship. You know, they want to repel each other, but they're stuck together. They have so much energy. Kinases, they are enzymes that move phosphates from one molecule to another molecule. And if a molecule gets a phosphate, two things happen. They change their shape, which you know that shape is everything. And two, it receives energy and becomes energized.
something else we need to talk about before we really get into the production of energy are redox reactions. We talked a little bit about this before, and hopefully you had this and remembered this in chemistry. The oxidation, a molecule will lose electrons in reduction. They gain electrons. Electron carriers will undergo redox reactions. We saw electron carriers in photosynthesis, and we talked about NAD. NAD, or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, is found in respiration, and it is an electron carrier. And NADP, which is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, is found in photosynthesis. And hopefully you remember that, because we just talked about that. These two energy carriers, or electron carriers, will receive two electrons and one hydrogen ion. Enzymes that will remove electrons and hydrogen ions, or that move, I'm sorry, not remove, but move electrons and hydrogen ions, are called dehydrogenases. So now you know of two enzymes, kinases and dehydrogenases. And that will be helpful later on when we talk about reactions. In aerobic respiration, you're really lucky because there are five steps. We have glycolysis, oxidative decarboxylation, the Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain, and oxidative phosphorylation. I like to call oxidative decarboxylation, ox decarbox, and oxidative phosphorylation is oxphos. We are going to start off with glycolysis, and we're going to do that in the next screencast. Hopefully, you're all set, and this helps.